What's up, what's up? It's Billy Carson, a.k.a. Forbidden Knowledge. Welcome to the Forbidden Knowledge Podcast. If you're here with me, I'm going to send out a quick text message notification so we can make sure everyone knows that we are in the house tonight and that we are live. And make sure you click the like button. Make sure you subscribe, all right? Because we want to make sure we catch that algorithm and make sure that everyone knows that we're on. So please also don't forget to share this video. Okay, text message just went out. Make sure you share the video. Going to be talking tonight about the secrets of the Sumerian tablets. One of the uh, most unread tablets that really is one of the most famous tablets. A lot of these people don't read tablets at all. And a lot of the stuff I say and say, you know, well, it's in this tablet, it's in that tablet. <laughs> we got a little Gabe in the back. I'm going to read from the Epic of Atrahasis tonight and break it down. And you can see we got little Gabe in the back. Yeah. <laughs> Say Take hi. All right. So, Gabe, you got on the esoteric shirt. He's wearing Thoth the Atlantean priest king on his uh, chest, and he's got We Come in Peace on the back with the esoteric logo. I got on the same thing. Okay. This is for the adults. We got it for adults. We got it for kids. And I got on the esoteric cap. That's a forbidden esoteric. <laughs> All right, Gabe. I'll catch you later. <laughs> he just wanted to pop in and say hi to everybody. That was kind of unplanned. <laughs> but again, cool anyways. Well, we got the Forbidden Esoteric uh, gear. So you want to go to uh, ForbiddenKnowledge.com and click on the online store and you can get all your Forbidden Esoteric clothing we have there. We do drops every single month. Uh, we got a lot of cool stuff, a lot of cool, really nice caps, high quality material. You can wash them. They don't shrink. They're already pre-shrunk. Shirt fits great. The shirt got me feeling like Iron Man over here. All right. And um, they're really cool, really cool stuff you can wear and you can, it'll last for a while. So it's high quality. All right. So I'm going to pull up on this side here. I'm going to pull up my topic for tonight, which is Atrahasis. And I'm going to be reading from that here shortly. All right. Um, and just let me get a couple more things set up while people are getting set up in the chat. All right. Yeah, make sure I got that. I'm going to pop on my other screen here real quick, guys, because I've got to make sure I get the word out. Got to make sure everyone hears this one tonight. It's going to be a really good podcast. And by the way, the podcast is back up on Spotify, posting consistently. So if you've been looking for it on Spotify for all the updated versions of the videos, we now have videos on Spotify, not just YouTube. So if you want to watch the video on Spotify or the audio on Spotify, you can do that as well. All right. So that's pretty cool. And so um, let me just put my topic in over here. And uh, we're going to get this party started. All right. We're going to get this party started. All right. So Atrahasis, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. And uh, let me just organize my screen because I want to read from the Epic of Atrahasis, okay? And uh, it's going to be a great talk because we're going to be talking about uh, a wise man who was saved from the flood after being warned. Who was Atrahasis? He was told to build a ship. Does that sound familiar to you? He was told to build a ship. Sounds like the biblical story of Noah. All right. He was told to build a ship. Thank you, Ronnie. R.A. Collins. Appreciate you. Now, what's interesting about that is this story is not only does it show up in the Epic of Atrahasis, we're talking about the Enuma Elish. It shows up in other ancient texts and tablets from around the world, scriptures, papyrus, cylinder scrolls, similar stories. How can all of these people on this one planet in different regions thousands of years ago know the same exact story? How? How is it possible? It's possible because just like every single one of you, pretty much most of you probably know, you know, um, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream or 
uh, London Bridges Falling Down or any of these other nursery rhymes, for example, right? This information was passed down and handed down generation to generation over eons around this entire planet because there was a global civilization, an advanced global civilization that existed. And when I get into the Atra Hasis epic, you're going to find out just how advanced. Now, I'm not going to go into the epic of Gilgamesh tonight. I'll do that another night. But tonight I'm going to go into the, the uh, epic of Atra Hasis, which is pretty, pretty dope, pretty incredible. It's a pretty incredible story. All right. Let me just put this laptop over here so I can pull up the uh, the screen here. So we're reading from the ep Epic of Atrahasis, one of the most ancient of ancient Sumerian tablets that exist. Uh, we know that the Epic of Atrahasis and the Enuma Elish were translated in the 1800s. <laughs> 1800s. So we're, we're, we're talking about something really old, really ancient. We're not talking about something that was just etched into some stone last week or last month or 100 AD. 100 AD is when the Bible was, the beginning stages of putting the Bible together happened. 100 AD to 900 AD, that's the biblical text. That's fairly recent, all right? I know in one of my most recent posts, I talked about the fact that Jesus is not real. The person was real, but the name is not real. The name is not accurate. It's a real name, but it's not an accurate name for the person. His name was Yeshua, right? Yeshua in ancient text and tablets, and even in the Torah, Yeshua, but they were calling him Jesus and now what more, quote unquote, modern times. The J was just added to the, um, to the uh, alphabet in 1524 AD. The J was added to the alphabet in 1524 AD. So who are you calling on when you call on the name of Jesus? You talk, you think you're talking about a person that walked the ground and existed with that exact name, but you're not. You, you need to be calling on Yeshua because that's the person's name. You're calling on a name that doesn't even, it's a fake name. The name, Yesh, uh, the name Jesus, it was Isus before the J was added. And who is Isus? Well, you know who that is, right? That's Enlil from the Emerald Tablets. I mean, from the Sumerian Tablets. That's Enlil. So we're talking about ancient texts and tablets that go back and predate all this biblical text. And we find a super ancient account of Atrahasis that exists long before, thousands and thousands and thousands of years before the biblical text was even assembled and put together. And how did they get the biblical text? They copied it from ancient scriptures, the papyrus, the cylinder scrolls, and so forth that was found all over the region. So we're going to read from the uh, Atrahasis tonight, all right? And the reason why I'm doing this is because I know the majority of people are never going to read this text. <laughs> so I'm going to read it for you, and you're going to listen. Now, there are some dead spots or some question mark spots where some of the stone was damaged, and um, some of the wording could not be um, deciphered, right? So let's get into this. When the gods instead of man, when the gods instead of man, so we're talking about these gods, but notice the gods even in here have a lowercase g, not a capital G for the creator of the universe, a lowercase g, meaning... Man has deified these people, even though these people were not the creators of the universe, but they had advanced knowledge and advanced technology. They did the work and bore the loads. So the gods used to do the work and bore the load. Now, think about this for a second. What are they talking about do the work? They're talking about this epic is kind of really beginning when these people came down from heaven to earth and began to turn mud into a kingdom in the ancient comedic uh, text, right? Then the Turu turned mud into a kingdom. These are the same exact people from the land of Kemet. Now they say when the gods instead of man did the work and bore the loads, the gods load was too great. Now think about this for a second. Think about this for a second. All right. I'll have to come back and answer this question a little bit later. Zetrock, thank you for the donation. I'll answer it later. Think about this for a second. Why in the world would the creator of the universe 
need to work and do labor and do hard labor. Why? Why would the God, why would the God of the universe have to bear the load and do labor? The work was too hard. The trouble was too much. Well, think about that. Well, what trouble, what work? If you're God, if you're the creator of the universe, why is the work too hard? Why is the load too hard to bear? The great Anunnaki. Now, let me stop right there. So many people have commented on my post. The word Anunnaki is made up. Zachariah Sitchin made up the name Anunnaki. No, Zachariah Sitchin got that from ancient texts that was already translated from the 1800s, long before he was a sperm and his daddy's do you know what. Okay? The wake-up call is here. The great Anunnaki made the EGG carry the workload sevenfold. Now, the EGG, you've heard me talk about the EGG, all right? The Ejiji were these uh, working class Anunnaki beings. And they were really like volunteers when you analyze the text. They were not slaves. However, they were, treat they were being treated like slaves. They were being treated like lower class citizens. And so they were starting to get pissed off because they were given seven times the workload as the other gods. And these people are, like I said, gods with the lowercase g. They're just men. They're flesh and blood people that put their pants on one leg at a time, just like you and me. So they made him carry the workload sevenfold. I knew their father was king. So I knew was like the head figure, right? A-N-U. Their chamberlain was Ninurta. Their canal controller, Inuji. They took the box of lots and cast the lots. The gods made the division. A new went up to the sky, and Enlil took the earth for his people. The bolt which bars the sea was assigned to far sighted Enki. When a new had gone up to the sky, and the gods of the Apsu had gone below, the Anunnaki of the sky made the Ejiji bear the workload. So these people went up into their sky ship. They're just kicking back. They got their feet up. They're relaxed. They're, they're chilling. They said, you guys, you guys do all the work. We're going to sit back and watch from the sky. Just keep laboring. Keep creating this breakaway civilization that we started here. Keep laboring and keep digging these canals and building the buildings and laying down the plumbing and everything else. We're going to watch from the sky. Now, this is, this is written before these Anunnaki had um, engaged mankind, our cousins that were already here on the planet. They weren't homo sapiens sapiens like us, but they were a version of us. They weren't engaged by these people yet, though. These people were still doing the work themselves to create their own breakaway civilization, kind of really ignoring us and leaving us alone, believe it or not. So he says, when a new head gone up to the sky and the gods of the absolute gone below, the Anunnaki of the sky made the EGG bear the workload. The gods had to dig out canals. Now, why in the world are gods digging out canals? So we're clearly talking about flesh and blood people. We're talking about people that had advanced technology and advanced knowledge. We're not talking about creators of the universe. So he says, the gods had to dig out canals, had to clear channels, the lifelines of the land. I'm talking about farming now. The EGG had to dig out canals, had to clear channels, lifelines of the land. The gods dug out the Tigris River. Wow. And then dug out the Euphrates. Then there's some missing pieces of the tablet. It says, in the deep, they set up the Apsu of the land. Inside it raised its top. All of the mountains, they were counting the years of loads. They had been laboring for quite some time, by the way. The Great Marsh, they were counting the years of loads. For 3,600 years, they bore the excess. 3,600 years is one rotation of their home planet around our sun. They call it a shar, according to these Anunnaki people. Hard work, night and day, they groaned and blamed each other. This is how you know they're not real gods. They groan. They're in pain. People are hurting. This back-breaking labor going on. 
They groaned and blamed each other, grumbled over the masses of excavated soil. Let us confront our masters, the Chamberlain, and get him to relieve us of our hard work. Come, let us carry, then it says the Lord, I think it was going to try to say Lord Enki something to the counselor of the gods because it's a broken piece of the tablet. The counselor of gods, the warrior from his dwelling, come, let us carry Enlil. Enlil is Yahweh in the modern day Bible. Let me tell you that again. In the modern day Bible, Enlil is Yahweh. He is the God that came back to Eden and noticed that the people had gained some damn sense and realized that they weren't freaking animals and put on clothes and got some knowledge in their freaking head from Enki, and he got pissed off about it. Enlil is the one, if you read the Epic of Gilgamesh and a lot of these other ancient tablets, that's killing off humans by the thousands and tens of thousands because they're just making too much noise. We're talking about a very evil person, an evil, evil person that ruled over this planet for quite some time. The council of the gods, the warrior from his dwelling. So they said, let's let's get to Enlil and talk to him. We got to get to the counselor of the gods. This guy's the head man in charge. We need to holler at him and tell him, hey, man, our backs are breaking here doing this labor. Then Allah made his voice heard. Oh, Allah, you thought that came from the Quran? No, it comes from <laughs> the Sumerian tablets. And spoke of the gods, his brothers. Then there's a gap about eight lines right here. He says, come, let us carry the counselor of gods, the warrior from his dwelling. Come, let us carry Enlil, the counselor of gods, the warrior from his dwelling. Now cry battle. Let us mix fight with battle. The gods listened to his speech, set fire to their tools, put aside their spades for fire, their loads for fire god. They flared up. When they reached the gate of warrior Enlil's dwelling, it was night in the middle watch. So what's happening here? There's a coup going on. There's a coup going on. These uh, EGG people, according to these tablets, were working on Earth and also working on Mars at the same exact time. They're working in two locations, Earth and Mars, according to these tablets, not according to Billy Carson. And the work was seven times the load to bear. So what happens? It says that they come down. The gods descended from Lamu. They come down from Mars to Earth to encircle the encampment of Enlil where he slept because now they're like hey he, we've been begging for relief we've been asking for a break that we've been working for thousands of years and their complaint was that hey man we need a break and if you don't if, you, if we don't get a break we're going to go to war these are the sons of God that fell to fell from heaven to earth and went against uh went against the Lord right this is what made it into the Bible but this is the actual real story right here the real story so he said, the house was surrounded by the God, but the God had not realized. It was night, the middle watch. Ikur was surrounded. Ikur is, the, uh, is their fort. And Lil had not realized, yet Kalkal was attentive and had it closed. He held lock and watched the gate. Kalkal roused Nuxu. They listened to the noise of the EGG. The Nuxu roused his master. Woke him, woke, him, woke him up. Get up, man. They out here. They're about to attack us, man. Made him get out of bed. My lord, your house is surrounded. A rabble is running around your door. And Lil, your house is surrounded. A rabble is running around your door. And Lil had weapons brought to his dwelling. Oh, they got weapons. And trust me, these ain't sticks. These are not sticks, okay? Which with carved uh, uh, rocks on the tip, <laughs> with sharp rocks on the edge. These are real weapons. He says, take your weapons and stand in front of me. Nuxu barred his door, took up his weapons and stood in front of Enlil. Nuxu made his voice heard and spoke to the warrior Enlil. Oh, my Lord, your face is, then it's got a damage here to the stone. Your face is, Tamar Tamarisk, why do you fear your own sons? So he's saying, hey, man, these are your people too. Like, what's going on here? 
right? Listen to them. Oh, and Lil, your face is shallow. Tamarisk, why do you fear your own sons? Send for a new to be brought down to you. Have Enki fetched into your presence. He sent for a new. A new is their father, right? He's the lead dude, right? He's the main guy. He sent for a new to be brought down to him. Enki was fetched into his presence. So they went and got Enki. They went and got a new. So now you got a new, who's the father. You got Enki, who's the son, and you got Enlil, who's another son. So these are two brothers, Enki and Enlil. As a matter of fact, Earth is named after Ea Enki. Ea, right? And then Ki is Earth. So that's where we get the name Earth from. It comes from an ancient Sumerian, quote unquote, lowercase g god, who just happens to be the father of Atrahasis, the guy that wrote the epic. All right. So this guy that I'm reading from. He's actually half human and half Anunnaki. Pretty interesting. That's where you get the name demigod from, right? The term demigod. So check this out. He says, he sent for Anu to be brought down to him. Enki was fetched into his presence. Anu, king of the sky, was present. They went and they, they contacted Anu, who was in the sky ship, and he came down to the planet. They went and got him. They, they summoned him, and he came on down. He never liked to stay down here too much, spend too much time on the surface of the planet. He'd rather uh, hang out in his skyship. That's what the text always says. Enu, king of the sky, was present. Enki, king of Apsu, attended. The great Anunnaki were present. Oh, there goes that word again, Anunnaki. I guess it is a real word in real ancient text, not fabricated and made up by Zacharias Hitchin, because Zacharias Hitchin didn't make up that name like a lot of these bad YouTube videos try to say. And Lil got up. And the chase was put, and Lil made his voice heard and spoke to the great gods. Is it against me that they have risen? Shall I do battle? What did I see in my own eyes? A rabble was running around my door. A new made his voice heard and spoke to the warrior and Lil. Let Nuxu go out and find out word of the EGG. In other words, let's go out there, send Nuxu out there to talk to these, these crazy people and tell us what they want. What do you want? Who has surrounded your door? A command to Enlil was uh, made. His voice was heard. Go to the next part of the tablet. And spoke to Vizier Nuxu. Nuxu, open your door. Take up your weapons and stand before me. In the assembly of all the gods, bow, then stand and tell them, your father Anu, your counselor warrior Enlil, your chamberlain Ninurta, and your canal controller Inuji have sent me to say, who is in charge of this rabble? Who was in charge of the fighting? Who declared war? Who ran the door of Enlil? Who ran to the door of Enlil? In other words, who's in charge here? Who's the one commanding this coup against these the rulers of planet Earth. Who is it? Who who allowed you guys, who approved you this mission for you guys to come down from Mars to Earth, to gather up any EGG on Earth, and to come all over here today? Where, where are they? They're in South Africa. They're at Adam's calendar in South Africa, which exists right now today. You can go there, and you'll find the oldest gold mines on Earth, 200,000 years old. Okay? You'll find them right there. All right? Uh, so I'll answer these questions at the end. So, he says, who ran to the door of Enlil? Nuxu opened his door, took up his weapons, and went before Enlil in the assembly of all the gods. He bowed and stood before, the, before and told the message. Father Anu, your counselor warrior Enlil, your chamberlain Ninurta, and your canal controller Inuji have sent me to say, who was in charge of the rabble? So it repeats itself here. Who declared war? I guess they're not answering, so they're asking this question again. And Lil says, every single one of us, gods declare war. We have put a stop to the digging. Now, now this is where the EGG is speaking here. They said, we have put a stop to the digging. In other words, we're, we're done doing the slave work. We're not working anymore. Do you notice the trend here about when, when you enslave somebody, even if you don't, even if you don't call them a slave, when you abuse somebody's natural living rights? At some point, it might take thousands of years, but at some point, the people will rebel. I don't care what planet you're from. 
the people will rebel. He said, we have put a stop to the digging. The load is excessive. It is killing us. Our work is too hard. The trouble is too much. So every single one of us gods has agreed to complain to Elil. See, they call themselves gods. Did you hear that? Every single one of us gods, they didn't call themselves slaves. They recognize that they're gods, that they're powerful. Every one of us gods has agreed to complain to Enlil, who's the most evil one of them all. Nuxu took his weapons, went and returned to Enlil. My Lord, you sent me. And I went and I explained. Every single one of us gods declare war, they said. We have put a stop to the digging. The load is excessive. It is killing us. Our work is too hard. The trouble is too much. So every single one of us gods has agreed to complain to Enlil. So he repeated the speech to Enlil. And they'll listen to that speech. His tears flowed. Oh, this guy's got a little compassion now all of a sudden. And they'll spoke guardedly, addressed the warrior anew. Noble one, take a decree with you to the sky. Oh, with you to the sky. He's telling the dad to get back up to the ship <laughs> and send a decree up there. Show your strength while the Anunnaki are sitting before you. Call up one God and let them cast him for destruction. You see, he thought he was crying because he was sad that the people were working too hard. Nah, he was crying because, you know what? I love these people, but man, you know what? I'm gonna have to destroy him anyway. This guy's a, a psychopathic narcissist. <laughs> this guy's a psychopathic narcissist. And that shows up in the biblical text as well. Right. When he destroys the Tower of Babel and all, that's a whole nother podcast. But it was Enlil that destroyed the Tower of Babel in the biblical text in the Old Testament. How do I know that? What's in ancient tablets that they just copied the story. The guy's just an, the absolute ultimate narcissist, psychopathic narcissist, by the way. I hope you guys share this video. We got twenty one hundred in here now. Check this out. He says. Check this out. He says, uh, Anu made his voice heard and spoke to the gods, his brothers. What are we complaining of? Their work was indeed too hard. He's like, Enlil, come on, man. Are you serious? Like, you want me to, you want me to blow up this city from, sky, from the space, from my ship, from the sky? Like, for real, dude? Like, these people are suffering, man. Like, you, you put too much work on them. I mean, it ain't a mystery. Like, you, you're busting their backs. He said the work was indeed too hard. The trouble was too much. Every day the earth resounded. The warning signal was loud enough. We kept hearing the noise. He's saying they've been telling us this. They've been complaining to us. They've been pissed off and angry. They've been letting us know they're overworked. The, the work, the, the load is too hard to bear. And we keep ignoring them. And now here they are. They're ready to go to battle against us because we didn't listen. Does these sound like the gods that created the universe? They sound like people to me. I'm just saying. I'm just asking for a friend because <laughs> these are the ones that are in the biblical text. Then there's a couple of missing phrases inside of this tablet is broken. Um... While the Anunnaki were sitting before you, and while Bilit Ili, the womb goddess, is present, call up one and cast him for destruction. Anu made his voice heard and spoke to Nuxu. Nuxu, open your door, take your weapons, bow in the assembly of the great gods, and then stand. And tell them your father Anu, your council warrior Enlil, your chamberlain Inerta, and your canal controller Inuji have sent me to say, who is in charge of the rabble? Who will be in charge of the battle? Which guard started the war? A rabble was running around my door. When Nuxu heard this, he took up his weapons, bowed in the assembly of the great gods, then stood and told them, your father Anu, your counselor warrior, and Lil, your chamberlain and nurture, and your canal control Inuji have sent me to say, who is in charge of this rabble? I mean, it kind of repeats it there you know, a little bit, but that's just, that's how it is, right? It's pretty interesting. Ea, that's Enki, made his voice heard and spoke to the gods, his brothers. Why are we blaming them? Enki says. Why are we blaming them? Enki is the same person who's considered to be the serpent 
that showed up in the Garden of Eden and talked to Adam and Eve. Same exact person. And when his brother shows up, uh, and Lil, who, aka Yahweh, he's pissed off because these people have gained some damn sense. The apple that Eve ate wasn't an apple like of a tree, a physical apple like a piece of fruit. It was knowledge. What does apple represent? Knowledge. They gain knowledge by talking to Enki that they had, they were self-aware, that they became, they were sentient beings, that they were on the same level as the Anunnaki, and that they weren't animals, and that this was a laboratory and they were being experimented on for mating purposes to duplicate and create a slave race. Enki had his voice heard and spoke to the gods as brothers. Why are you blaming them? Their work was too hard. Their trouble was too much. Every day the earth resounded. The warning signal was loud enough. We kept hearing the noise. There it is. Billet Ely, the womb goddess, is present. Let her create a pre, pre primeval man. Got to read the way this is um, broken down from the Sumerian. Let her create primeval man. So this is where, now we've reached a point where Enki is like, okay, Either we're going to go to battle against this mob of angry EGG and lose because they outnumber us, or we got to come up with a solution. And we better come up with one pretty damn quick. We better come up with a solution pretty damn quick, or it's going to be all over for us. This will be our last stand right here, right? So Enki says, you know, I have an idea. Let the womb goddess create a primeval man. This is the first instance of engaging and genetically modifying the existing hominid on this planet that they used to at that point were leaving alone. They came here about 450,000 years ago and they worked for 250,000 of those 450,000 years themselves when you add up all the shards in the ancient text, right? And then 200,000 years ago, they decided to do this primeval man and make them bear the load. And guess what? When does modern science say Homo sapiens showed up on this planet? 200,000 years ago. Just go to any college book and you'll read it and you'll find out that's what the answer is. You think that's a coincidence? So he says, let the womb, uh, let the womb goddess, goddess, let her create primeval man so that they may bear the yoke, so that they may bear the yoke, the work of Enlil. Oh, we're talking about turning people into slaves now. Now we're getting into real slavery. Now we understand the real full objective here is, okay, we were kind of treating y'all like slaves. We didn't listen. We, My bad. <laughs> now we're going to go ahead and uh, take these people on this planet, turn them into our slaves now, and let them do the work of Enlil. Because Enlil was building big cities. He had this big master plan on the previous tablet where he's showing his sister, Ninurta, that... He had a plan he was going to put on this earth for all time. He said, this plan is for all time. From this point forward, everything on this earth will be built based on my blueprint. And guess what? It still is till this very day. To this very day, his blueprint of building cities and structures and communities and all that is still on this planet today after all these tens of thousands of years. Right? He says, so that they may bear the yoke, so that they may bear the yoke. The work of Enlil. Let man bear the load of the gods. Let man bear the load of the gods. Bilatili, the womb goddess, is present. Let the womb goddess create offspring. Oh, in the Bible it says, let us make man in our image. Don't let these pastors fool you with the foolishness. They give you the trickery. Oh, that's the Holy Ghost and the this and the... No, man. It came from this Atrahasis and the Enuma Elish. That's where it came from. There is no, this is the people who said, let us make man in our image. It's right here in the tab. It's actually coming up next. And let man be the Lord of the gods. They called up the goddess, asked the midwife of the gods, wise mommy, you are the womb goddess. In um, Egypt, she's uh, Hathor. It's Hathor. The goddess Hathor is, is uh, the womb goddess. The creator of mankind. Great primeval man that he may bear the yoke. Let him bear the yoke, the work of Enlil. Let man bear the load of the gods. Let man bear the load of the gods. 
Nintu made her voice heard and spoke to the great gods. It's not proper for me to make him. She's like, wait a minute, man. Hold on. This ain't right, man. This really, you know what? Y'all ain't right. She's like, hold on. I got to make my voice heard. I don't agree with this. I do not agree with this. And guess what? The work of Enkis, he makes everything pure. If he gives me clay, I will do it. Enki made his voice heard and spoke to the great gods. On the first, seventh, and fifteenth of the month, I shall make a purification by washing. Then one god shall be slaughtered, and the gods can be purified by immersion. Nintu shall mix clay with his flesh and his blood. They're not talking about taking one actual Anunnaki god and killing him. Some people have translated it that way. What they're talking about is taking genetic material from this guy, from this being, whichever one it was. They're talking about taking genetic material, which is going to be mixed together in something they call clay, but I'm pretty sure it's not the clay we know about. It's something else that allows life to persist. Most likely, uh, some type of a... Um, some type of a base or a zygote of some type or whatever it is, but it's definitely not dirt clay from the ground. Let us bear, let us hear the drum beat forever after. Let a ghost come into existence from the God's flesh. Let a ghost come into existence. We're talking about an evolution here through one generation, through this one birth. We're talking about a ghost. Who's the ghost? We're talking about the consciousness inhabiting this new being. We're talking about mankind coming in through this new genetic modification as a new homo sapiens sapien on this planet, which is born and bred specifically to be a, become a slave. Every single human being, not just blacks, not just whites, not just Asians, not just indigenous people, not just all humans to become slaves. And guess what? The majority of humans are still slaves to this very day and don't even recognize it. In some cases, physical slaves through employment. In some cases, if you're not doing what you love to do. And in some cases, mental enslavement is still happening nonstop around this entire planet. And that, that is without a doubt. I run into mental slaves every single day. I have people arguing with me that the J wasn't new and that Jay did exist in the time that Jesus was alive. And are uh, you trying to rewrite history, man? <laughs> it was no Jay. It didn't exist till 1524. The guy's name ain't Jesus, man. Just, just, just come to terms with it. The guy's name wasn't Jesus. His name was Yeshua. Just live with it. And, you know, say, Hey man, I got, I, I was duped this whole time. I've been calling on the name. I've been calling on Zeus this whole damn time. I didn't even know it. That's why my prayers ain't been getting answered. Anyway, <laughs> Mental slaves, just ridiculous. Check this out. He says, on the, on the first, seventh, and 15th of the month, I shall make a purification by washing. Then one God should be slaughtered, and the gods can be purified by immersion. Then two shall mix clay with his flesh and blood. Then a God, a God and a man, then a God, here we go, here it goes, a God and a man, will be mixed together. They're talking about genetically mixing human DNA and these gods, which are Anunnaki DNA. You know, we know they're Anunnaki because that's what they call themselves in this text, which predates everything that exists. So there you go. In the Bible, they're called the Anak, A-N-A-K. And it says in that verse where they mentioned the Anak, it says we were like grasshoppers in their eyesight because these people were massive people. He says, then a God and a man will be mixed together in clay. Let us bear, I'm sorry, let us hear the drum beat forever after. Let the ghost come into existence from the God's flesh. Let her proclaim it is a living sign and let the ghost exist so as to not forget the slain God. Oh, let the ghost exist so as not to forget the slain God. Interesting. That's the same way as saying, let us make man in our image. In other words, every time we look on this being, we're going to see ourselves in it. They answered yes in the assembly. The great Anunnaki who assigned the fates. 
They call themselves assigners of faith. They call themselves ordainers of destiny in the text, too. On the 1st, 17th, and 15th of the month, he made a purification by washing. The Walla, who had who uh, had intelligence, they slaughtered in their assembly. Nintu mixed the clay with the, his flesh and his blood. They heard the drum beat forever after. A ghost came into existence from the god's flesh. And she, Nintu, proclaimed it as a living sign. In other words, they got a living being now. They got a modification. We got the first valid modification going on. The ghost existed so as not to forget the slain god. After she had mixed that clay, she called up the Anunnaki and the great gods, the Ejiji, the great gods. Oh, they called the Ejiji great gods too. So it's clear that they weren't slaves. Spat spittle upon the clay. Mommy made her voice heard and spoke to the great gods. I have carried out perfectly the work you ordered of me. I have another word. She said, I completed my mission, right? Let me see if I can get this tablet over here. Hold on a second. You have slaughtered a god together with his intelligence. Oh, wow. I have relieved you of your hard work. He's talking to the Ajiji now. Your hard work is that your days of hard work and slavery is over. Return to do whatever you please now. I have imposed your load on man. You have bestowed noise on mankind. So now you have bestowed, bestowed all this stress, this 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 hard work, this backbreaking labor, and everything else is now going to fall on man. We're going to be the ones making noise. We're going to be the ones complaining. We're going to be the ones. But guess what? We don't have the power to overthrow them because they got more technology than us. There won't be a battle coming to the door of Enlil from humans. I have undone the fetter and granted freedom. So the EGG now is just saying, look, you guys are free to do whatever you want. They listened to this speech of hers. And they were freed from anxiety and kissed her feet. We used to call you mommy, but now your name shall be mistress of all gods. Go down some here. Farsighted Enki and wise mommy went to the room of fate. The womb goddess were assembled. He trod the clay in her presence. She kept reciting an incantation for Enki, staying in her presence, made her recite it. When she finished her incantation, she pinched off 14 pieces and seven pieces to the right and seven on the left. Between them, she put a mud brick. She used and some broken pieces in the tablet. She used a reed to cut the umbilical cord. Called up the wise and knowledgeable womb goddess, seven and seven, Seven created males and seven created females. So they done took this thing and split it up. So what they're talking about here when she's saying here, seven pieces on the right and seven pieces on the left, we're talking about cell division. What they did was they found a way here to divide these and split these embryos into seven embryos on one side and seven on the other. So they had seven males and seven females that they had created through this method. If you really read into this, the way it's read, the way it's reading, it sounds like cloning, a cloning technique to make these clones. And so she so used the same exact clay, the same exact genetic material that was in it, whatever this clay is. And, and then from there, she was able to get seven pieces on the left and seven pieces on the right and took them to full term. And then she cut their umbilical cords. And she had seven created males and seven created females. This is before Adam and Eve existed, by the way. There's no Adam and Eve at this point. There's still no Adam and Eve. They came much later down the line. Much later. We're talking about the first set of man that was made to bear the load of these EGG. They were made and created by this cloning process. The problem that they had with this cloning process, the further you read into it, these people couldn't reproduce on their own. They couldn't actually have sex together and make their own babies. That was the problem. So they had to keep going through this process of like continuing to make these people by this cloning method. And it was a lot of work. So they wanted to perfect it to where these people can reproduce on their own. And evidence of this is when you look at the biblical text of the Old Testament, and Cain kills Abel, and then Cain is, 
you know, being talked to by God, who's actually in Lil. And he's pissed off because he's like, man, you killed your brother. Your brother gives me the best food, man. I was like, I like that food. He used to get the offerings were the food of the gods, by the way. They used to eat this stuff. And so he's pissed off at him like, man, I got to kick you out of here, man. This is some this is foul. You didn't. This guy was bringing me fresh food all the time. Now you killed him. Now what am I going to do? I'm not going to go out here and hunt. So Cain tells him, says, if I go out there. They're going to kill me. This is in the Bible. Now, remember, this is supposed to be Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel at this, at this moment. So where's the, where's the they that the they that exist out there that are going to kill Cain? Where, who are these people? These are the people. The ones that wise mommy was creating, all right, in South Africa. The one that wise mommy was creating in South Africa and making tons and tons of these people to do the load of the EGG. These are the people that were out there. And obviously, these people must have been kind of violent. And he knew about them being violent because he was worried that they were going to kill him. Because they're crazy. And God says, well, really, it's not God, it's Enlil. He says, oh, don't worry. This is in the biblical text. I'll put a mark on you so that people know you're me, you're, you're minds. All right? A genetic marker. So when he went out from the Garden of Eden, people recognized him as being owned by who? Enlil. A genetic marker. Just like you brand a cow, well, human beings are also branded. You think that you're a different race than me because you're just, you think you're white because your ancestors came from the mountains and, and you think you're black because your ancestors were working in the fields and that's baloney, that's garbage. That's fake news. The reason why we have different uh, races of people on the planet is because we have we have genetic markers on us to make us look like the people that ruled over us in those regions of the planet. Whatever region of the planet you were ruled over, they put a genetic marker on you to look like them. That's how they identified you. And now how people identify, oh, these are so-and-so's people. Don't touch Enki's people. Oh, these are Enlil's people. Don't touch Enlil's people. These people look just like the way we look racially, Asian, African, Caucasian, indigenous Americas, yellow people, red man, all that. When you read the description of these people, these Anunnaki people in these ancient tablets, you found out that they look just like us. Just different bodies, bigger bodies, bigger heads. But a lot of the features are the same. And they put genetic markers on us. And how do I know this is a fact? When you do and go and study real genetics, modern genetics in university, you can go get those books yourself, actually. They're available to you on Amazon. You discover something very interesting. The difference between the races of people on this planet, black, white, Asian, and so forth, is a 2% variance. 2% variance in genes you can't get that in DNA. You can't get that variance at 2% in only 200,000 years to get all the different races of people. It's actually impossible. And even geneticists and scientists and biologists have said it's impossible. So they assume it must have been done by an artificial mutation. The reason why we're different races of people is because somebody did that to us on purpose. Not because we evolved into different races. It's garbage. My, I'm not brown, dark brown because my ancestors were out in the fields in Africa a thousand years and 10,000 years ago. That's actually a laughable science. It's a laughable statement. And when you look into it, you discover 2% variance will take millions of years to happen by natural evolution. Didn't happen that way. We know that Darwinian evolution is an absolute farce. It's garbage. Didn't happen. So he says, look, she met you. So she said she called up the wise and knowledgeable womb, got a seven and seven, seven, and seven created males, seven created females. So these are the clones of the beginning of the clone age. What do you get? What do, what do you think George Lucas gets the clones and all that out of Star Wars? He got this all this stuff from ancient text. For the womb goddess is creator of fate. Then he got a broken piece of tablet here. Them by two, it says something about them by two. Them by two in her presence. I think they're talking about making two and two, two and two over and again, over and over again. 
That's what it kind of seems like it's trying to say here where the tablet's a little bit broken. Mommy made these rules for people. In the house of woman who is giving birth, the mud brick shall be put down for seven days. Billatilly, wise mommy, shall be honored. The, mid the midwife shall rejoice in the house of the woman who gives birth. So now they got this cloning thing and this zygote thing down packed. They're making it happen. They're celebrating themselves. Oh, we're so good. Look what we've done. We now have created a new slave race to do the work for us. I want to be honored on special days. I want holidays named after me. <laughs> These people are crazy. These are crazy. You're talking about ultimate narcissistic psychopaths, sociopaths. This is it. It don't get no crazier than this. This is wild. And, the, and, and, and when the woman gives birth to the baby, the mother of the baby shall serve her herself, sever herself, a man to a girl, to her bosom. There's some broken tablets here. A beard can be seen on a young man's cheek. In gardens and waysides, a wife of her husband choose each other. So they're talking about now, as they're now growing up to a certain point, they leave their parents. We're taking them away from their parents. As soon as we can tell they're in puberty, we see a little bit of hair on the neck. We see that the woman's starting to develop a little bit of a body. The girl's starting to develop a body. We're going to sever her. We can see her bosom now, it says. We can see her bosom. We can see a beard being seen. We're taking them away from the parents. We're ripping them away from the parents now. We're taking them and we're putting them into this other area where we're going to make them mate. This is where the, you know, they started mating them like animals. And Nintu was present. They counted the months, called up the 10th month as a term of fates. So what they're saying is, instead of a nine-month pregnancy, these pregnancies were lasting 10 months at that time. They were 10-month pregnancies, not nine. And to add credence to that, even further on, when Adam was the firstborn, uh, I guess you say, perfected version of Homo sapiens sapien, uh, one of the actual Anunnaki women themselves gave birth to him because they were trying to perfect the process so that they can mate on their own. And it was a 10 month term as well. And she held him up and said, my hands have made it the Adamu, which means first man. I'm giving you all the real history of Earth now, the real history of where we come from. This is the closest you're going to get to real history. All that garbage you've been listening to on TV and National Geographic and all these other people. And going to school and getting these old ass school books that have no real knowledge in them. This is the closest you're going to get to finding out how we got here. I'm giving you the knowledge right now. I have a brand new workshop coming up where I'm going to reveal the secrets of the Anunnaki. And the two secret tablets that were banned from mankind that I have that I'm going to break down to you. That workshop is coming very, very soon. I'm going to let you guys know about this workshop. I don't have it ready yet, but in a few more days, I'll have it ready. I'll be able to invite you to that private four-hour workshop where I break down these two sacred tablets that were written by Thoth the Atlantean from the land of Kemet. Got to take a quick commercial break real quick. I got to play um, something here. We have a couple of amazing events coming up. First and foremost, I'm taking another 70 people to Egypt. So if you're on here and you want to come to Egypt with me, click the link in my bio. Go to the Forbidden Tour of Egypt. It's the Forbidden Tour of Egypt. I want to show you what it looked like in Egypt for us, okay? It was an amazing, amazing trip. I'm going to play you a short clip of the, the fun that we had and the people that we had, how great we were, and what a great time we had out there in Egypt. Check this out.
All right. Listen, it was a, an amazing tour. I dropped a link in the chat. If you guys want to be able to go to Egypt with me, I'll drop it in there one more time. Uh, make sure you register ASAP if you're really serious about going, because as you know, last year sold out almost instantly. And this year's the one coming up for next year is going to be going just as fast because it's a highly sought after VIP tour, super VIP. We have armed guards in the front of our tour bus, armed guards in the back of our tour buses. We have armed guard on each bus to make sure that everyone is safe and we get to our destination perfectly safely. We only stay in five star hotels. Your airfare in Egypt is actually included when we're traveling. So your airfare that you need to go back and forth with us, that's covered. Your Nile cruise is covered. Your food and meals covered. Amazing tour. You can't get this with anybody else. So if you want to go with me, I'll be there in two weeks with this first group or this, this next group because I took a, a big group last year um, coming up. But this is for the next one. So you want to come to the next one, you got to register because they fill up very fast. All right. Uh, also, we do have the Blueprint for God Power coming up very soon. The Blueprint for God Power taught by Dr. B. Sirius and myself, Billy Carson. Another amazing workshop you don't want to miss, a life-changing event. Would you like a different destination? Are you ready to be the captain of the ship? We're going to challenge people. So when you can combine spiritual concepts with financial literacy, then you really tap into your God power. And we are navigating through multiple matrices. Once you do this workshop, it's going to take everything in your being to not become the person that you came to be. All right. You don't want to miss the blueprint for God power that's coming up. Talk by Dr. B. Sirius and myself, Billy Carson. It's going to be an amazing, amazing workshop. Um, and it's going to be a great, great time. I'm looking forward to it. And thank you for everyone here in the chat tonight. I appreciate every single one of you. Uh, this is going to be a phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal time. And I want to be able to finish this Atra Hasis epic. So what I'm going to do is this is, um, I got down to number nine. How many more do I have to go here? Let me see. Hold on a second. Because I'm going to have to make a part two. Yeah, we got about quite a few more pages left. But I got to a really, really good part of this, which gives you a lot of information. I think what I want to do is I want to come back and do a part two. And I want to do like a, probably another nine or this was 10. I do another 10 uh, parts of this tablet and break it down to you a little bit more. Because I know the average person never going to get a chance to read ancient Sumerian tablets. So I'm going to read them for you. I'm going to read them for you. All right. And, uh, and break them down in a way you can actually understand what the heck is going on, all right? And so um, if you want to learn more about the Sumerian tablets, if you want to decipher some of this stuff for yourself, you can actually go to the UCLA CDLI online cuneiform digital library. It's a mouthful. The UCLA CDLI online cuneiform digital library on that digital online ucla cuneiform library you can actually grab virtual stones of the sumerian tablets off the virtual shelf and drop them right into a translator and read them for yourself okay you don't have to um rely on me you can read them for yourself what happened to the gg uh douglas last says well the gg they literally still exist they were a part of a huge war, though. There was eventually a huge, what they call a pyramid war. And this pyramid war extended from Earth to the moon and also even to Mars. And unfortunately, in the Sumerian tablets, they said that they used weapons of mass destruction. Does that sound familiar to you? They used weapons of mass destructions in the tablets. So this war used some type of a nuclear weapon. Uh, and the evidence of this is at Mohenjo-Daro in the Indus Valley, where you can still see the buildings have turned to glass. Right now, today, there's dead bodies still laying in the street in Mohenjo-Daro in the Indus Valley with their hands, holding hands. Dead bodies still today, thousands of years later. No evidence that they've been scavenged. Why? If you take out a Geiger counter, you'll find that the background radiation is higher than the normal background radiation because they're still irradiated. That's why animals won't eat the bodies. The bodies are decomposing at a very slow rate, but they're still there. 
Then you go and look at the Mars REMS unit data, and you see something very interesting. Excessive amounts of xenon in the atmosphere and from the soil samples that we've gathered, excessive amount of xenon in the soil. Well, what does that mean? What does xenon mean in the soil and the atmosphere? Xenon is a it's weapons grade xenon. So it's a it's a byproduct of nuclear war. If you have a nuclear blast, one of the byproducts of that is xenon. And you can detect its um, you know, it, it's uh it, it's 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 sig signature, and you can tell whether it's weapons grade or whether it's not. It's weapons grade xenon, and that is by actual real scientists. That's a statement. And so, so I think John Brandenburg even wrote a book about it, scientists. Pretty interesting stuff. What is weapons grade xenon? doing in the soil and in the atmosphere on Mars, the planet that they call the planet of war, right? Mars is the god of war. There's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. I answered a couple more, then I got to get out of here. Uh, need some help. It's possible to synthesize Egyptian NTR and the Anunnaki. I believe they may be the same primordial waters Atlantis. I don't really understand the question Tony Apsu, uh, if you can write it a little bit differently, that's a little a little ambiguous. I can't really figure out what you're trying to say there. Um, and also, let me go back to some of these previous ones that I promised somebody I would give them an answer real quick. And then I got I to gotta rock and roll. I can't see them from here. Doggone it. Or maybe I can go up here and see. I don't know. I can't get to them. Anyway, I'm trying to answer a few questions for these people over here, but I can't get to the questions from super previous, although I thought I could from this app, but I guess I can't. Somebody says, how do you get to see all the tablets stored in the Vatican? There's a lot of, there's five miles of underground chambers in the Vatican archives, five miles. And only the elite of the elite have access we're talking about the super Jesuits. We're talking about the black Pope. And I don't mean a black man that's a Pope. I'm talking about the Pope that wears the black outfit, the black Pope. He's also a super Jesuit. Those people have uh, access, direct access to those archives. Okay. Uh, I can't get to this. Pre I thought I could get to the previous ones, but I just, I thought I could, uh, for some reason I can't get to them anyway. It's been a good night. That was two uh, about now, maybe a little bit more than a third of the um a little bit more than a third of the epic of Atrahasis. Okay. The epic of Atrahasis. I'm gonna go into it a little bit more when I come back on. I'm gonna do some more of the tablet and break it down even further and go deeper into the story so you can have an understand an understanding of what happened in the ancient past. Um Zetrox says. I asked earlier if we have a future with all the corruptions and things going on. Sometimes I feel lost, 23 years old. So Zetrock7, good question. First and foremost, I want to tell you that don't worry about the world coming to an end. Don't worry about the corruptions that's going on out there. Don't worry about the situation that's happening in Polytrix and pharmaceuticals and Big Pharma and everything else. Because mankind is resilient. Mankind is strong. Mankind will overcome. Even though a lot of stuff have, has happened to us and we have had a boot on our neck, if you look at period of times in the course of history, we always remove that boot at some point. We always rise above at some point. Even slavery cannot persist forever because the people eventually will stand up and fight. And you saw the Ijiji who called themselves gods, even they had enough of enough and stood up and was ready to fight. And their DNA is what's inside of our body. So if they had enough and they call themselves gods, well, we're, we're gods too. And we, we're about to have enough. It's a point where there's a certain percentage of people that have to, to have to reach that point where we all have enough, have had enough. And then we stand up. We unite and then we stand together like the, like the Ijiji did. I'm very optimistic that there's a, a new day dawning soon on this planet, okay? I'm very optimistic that that's happening. I'm very optimistic that mankind will get through this dark age, and I do mean dark age just because 
not that we're in the dark ages anymore, but we are in, a, in, a, in one of the best times to be alive, but we're also daunting. We're living a daunting existence with 30,000 nuclear warheads pointed directly at us while we're still on the planet with no escape hatch. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen. I mean, can you imagine an alien race flying near this planet and scanning it and saying, oh, wow, they got, they got nukes? They know how to split the atom. Let's go check them out. They're technologically advanced, but let's see what they're using this nuclear energy for because that's dangerous stuff. Oh, wait a minute. They, they got these things inside. Oh, these are bombs. They got bombs pointed at themselves while they're still on the planet. Oh, my goodness. This is a ghetto. We got to get out of here. So we have a lot of growing up to do as, as a species on this planet. Um, I think that the state that we're in right now, we're probably not going to blow ourselves up, believe it or not. Uh, we know for a fact that these UFOs have showed up at military bases in broad daylight has been testified by actual nuclear scientists and the guy who actually has the nuclear codes at that time who testified before Congress that UFOs showed up in broad daylight, daylight and deactivated the nukes. So if that's the case... I think they're sending us a message or sent us a message saying, hey, you guys are not going to use these, not on this planet, because it's too valuable. So we received a blessing when that happened, a blessing that they're letting us know they can stop us whenever they want from destroying this planet, because this planet is too valuable to them and, and many others. So this planet right now is a, it's an abandoned seed colony, and we're the colonists. We have been so programmed over many eons that we have become the prisoners and the prison guards. And we have to get to a point where we see ourselves as one and we, 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 we don't fall for the divide and conquer tactics anymore. And that we understand the true power that's already inside of us and that we are all gods. And that the spark that created the entire universe is inside of our body. And each one of us has the power of a hundred trillion men. We can move mountains with our words. We can shift uh, universes with our thoughts. And when we come to that realization, wow, what a crazy, incredible place this is going to be. We have to begin to love one another. Otherwise, it's all going to collapse. But I'm optimistic and I do believe that it's going to happen. I do believe that it's going to be amazing. I do believe that we're going to see another golden age. I do believe that we're going to get there. It just takes time. I believe that right now, according to the ancient Yuga cycle, we're in the Tetra Yuga, which is on the side that's swinging up back towards the Golden Age. So we're in the beginning stages of a Silver Age, if you want to convert that into modern idiom. And it's only a matter of time before we get to where we're going. We just have to keep pushing and keep learning and keep striving. And the most important part is to understand and learn where you came from, which is why I go through these ancient tablets. These ancient tablets are as close as you're possibly going to get to the truth. Are they 100% accurate truth? I would say no. I'm honest. But they're closer than anything else we got. They're pretty damn close. All right? They're pretty damn close. So we have to understand. Oh, that's what somebody was giving me. to Let me, let me know somebody that did a super chat. So we have to understand, like, hey, What's it going to take? It's going to take persistence, resilience, perseverance, and we can all get there. Uh, Walter TX, Walter Texas says, uh, Firelight, who didn't see her super chat. Thank you, Firelight. I apologize. I can't find your super chat. Um, but I'll, the next time you come on, just send me three messages in the chat so I can see it at once, and I'll make sure I answer that question if I because I just can't find it. There's so many questions in here right now. But I appreciate every single one of you. All right, everyone, I got to get out of here. I got some work to do. I do have one more link to drop in the chat. I'm doing an Unleash Your Divine Power workshop with Mike Rashid. He's an amazing thought leader that's coming up at the end of this month. If you want to participate in that workshop, uh, it's Unleash Your Divine Power. And on here, you can actually click the link in my bio and click on Unleash Your Divine Power. If you want to join me at the end of this month, September 30th, for about six hours, on a private workshop, a private class, all right? I'll be there for six hours, and you can join that by clicking on that link, and uh, it'll be amazing, all right? 
anyway, I appreciate you guys. I love you. Thanks for hanging out. And uh, hopefully I see some of y'all in Egypt in a couple of weeks. It's coming up. All right. Catch y'all later.